I'm absolutely delighted to be here. And um, it's my first time in Puerto Vallarta, but not my first time in Mexico. So I do want to do um, some stage, stage setting because how many here have heard of Bitcoin? Everybody, right? And how many people have invested in some kind of cryptocurrency, whether it's Bitcoin or some other one? I'm seeing a few hands. So we're actually not going to be talking about cryptocurrency very much in this presentation. We're going to be talking about blockchain technology, which makes cryptocurrency possible but also much more. And so we're really gonna be focused on blockchain technology. Uh, I am a partner in a fund that invests in blockchain technology and I love cryptocurrencies, so come find me later to talk about that if you wanna go in deeper. Um, but I wanna talk about why we're talking about blockchain technology and, and what, what's exciting about blockchain technology. Obviously we have some crazy price swings in the cryptocurrency markets, um, but blockchain technology is a pretty incredible exponential technology. And Gartner Research actually predicts that the business value that will be generated from blockchain technology will be over $3 trillion by 2030. That's a lot. And if we're lucky, the business value generated from blockchain technology, and this is taking digital assets or cryptocurrencies totally aside. So whatever will happen with Bitcoin, whatever will happen with other cryptocurrencies, the business value that can be generated from blockchain technology is pretty incredible. And the value that we have now is in the tens of billions, maybe a hundred billion max, right? And so there's a tremendous amount of room for this to grow. And I've, I've even seen higher numbers from MIT's Digi Digital Currency Initiative um, and from some other organizations. So before we dive into how blockchain technology works, I wanna share with you that here in Mexico, there are already exciting initiatives around using blockchain technology. So there's a pilot program where the Mexican government is working with blockchain technology startup to figure out how to put procurement projects onto the blockchain. Because we have a tremendous problem, not just in Mexico, but all over the world with corruption and with procurements and government contracts being delivered to people's friends. And with changes in numbers and changes in requirements happening, midway through and no one knowing about it. And we just had an incredible presentation on how easy it is to hack the ordinary internet. Another incredible problem that's an opportunity as we learned from David Roberts yesterday is according to the World Bank, only 30% of land globally is documented. And when land is not documented, when you can't prove that you own your land, you have a problem because you can't use your land as collateral. So insecure land ownership is a tremendous barrier to economic development for the most vulnerable populations in our world. And this is actually a problem here in Mexico too. Uh, there are relatively robust land records in, in cities, um, but there are still problems around communally owned land, how to document that community owned land, how to understand ownership of that land. And even with relatively robust urban ownership, there's still a problem, there's still potential problems with land titles. Even in the US, this is a problem. So in the US, when you buy a property, you have to buy title insurance. And that's insurance in case the person who sold you the property didn't really own it, in case they didn't have perfect title to their land. And so Remax, which is an enormous real estate conglomerate here in Mexico, is actually working with a startup based in San Diego called XYO Network in order to start to build the, the foundational building blocks for a blockchain-based land registry in Mexico. And they're trying to figure out how to tokenize, how to represent land parcels using these digital tokens that can be tracked over time. So with some examples of how blockchain technology is already being used today in Mexico, and this notion that this technology could potentially create trillions of business value in just over a decade, let's talk about how blockchain technology works. And, and again, here I'm gonna do some level setting. How many people have sent an email today? I, I, I should see every hand. I know it's early, but. Um, and how many of you really understand the DNS system and the mathematics of how the ones and zeros that are your email get from one place to another? Okay, I'm seeing fewer hands. And so the reason I say this is that you can all send an email 
You can conceptually understand how an e email works. You can even conceptually understand how the internet works without necessarily having to go into the mathematics. And so for those of you who do want to do a deep dive in the mathematics, I'm around all day today, but we're going to go for that conceptual level of understanding of blockchain technology. So I have an analogy for you. For those of you who've ever used Excel uh, and you've entered information to Excel and you've tried to manage out Excel, maybe in a business school project, you know how difficult it can be to maintain the master copy of the information. We're emailing copies and versioning back and forth and it gets confusing and information can be lost. And in fact, there are companies like SAP that have incredible international businesses, multi-billion dollar businesses around managing out master copies of information, master copies of transaction records for business. And so we have this innovation now where instead of Excel, you can use something like Google Sheets. For those of you who haven't used Google Sheets, it gives you the opportunity to collaborate practically in real time on a transaction history, on a spreadsheet, on a set of records. But the problem with Google Sheets is that it's incredibly insecure. Despite the fact that Google is, has a great security team, with Google Sheets, you can go ahead and you can delete the edit history. And so when you delete the edit history, it means that you can make changes and then you can just erase that you were the one to make those changes. And that's a problem because if you can go ahead and you can delete the edit history, if you can delete your audit trail, then once you're hacked, or if the information is changed or someone corrupt decides to change the information, it's very difficult to go ahead and actually try to fix that. Or, and, or even to understand exactly what happened, to even understand the nature of the attack. And so with blockchain technology, you can think about it a little like Google Sheets. We have this ability to collaborate in real time on a transaction history, on records, but you can't delete the edit history. So like Google Sheets without being able to delete the edit history. And I'll go a bit more into what that means. So with blockchain technology, what you have is you have peer-to-peer -peer distributed information. And what that means is that instead of having a central copy of the information protected by a big moat, instead, every single node or every single participant in the network can actually have a copy of the whole history of the transactions. And so with blockchain technology, that's what you want to think about. You want to think about updating a network across copies, across participants, across nodes, in the same way at the same time. And here we run into a really interesting opportunity or challenge, because this problem of how do you update the network in the same way at the same time, across the copies, that is a very, very difficult mathematical problem. And so that problem was actually only first solved by Satoshi Nakamoto with the development of Bitcoin. So it was the ability to update the network in the same way at the same time across the nodes to allow the network to achieve consensus that makes blockchain possible and that makes these applications of blockchain possible. Because if you think about it, if you didn't update the network in the same way at the same time across the nodes, you could go in and cheat the network. You could go in and make changes and erase the fact that you made those changes. And so now here's our question. Our question is, well, how does the network update in the same way at the same time across nodes? And I'm, I'm sharing with you here a little bit of a black box. I'm saying cryptography is used to update the network. And at the end of the presentation, I'm going to share with you how fast blockchain technology is moving and where it's going. Um, but for now, I'm sharing with you, it's this black box of cryptography. And for those, how, how many people have heard that Bitcoin uses a lot of energy and that it's slow? So it's true, the Bitcoin unit network does use a lot of energy. It is slow. Now, there are still some incredible advantages to Bitcoin. But that said, there are new ways of updating the network in the same way at the same time across the copies, across the nodes. And those new ways can be faster, and those new ways can use less energy. And so these examples that I'm going to share with you of how blockchain technology is used in business actually use some of these new ways of updating the network. And we're going to get into this right at the end of the presentation. Um, but what you need to remember is that what happens is when you have cryptography, whatever that underlying cryptography is, just like you can send your email 
without necessarily having to understand DNS, you can actually use your blockchain network to update a distributed system in the same way at the same time across the copies using your cryptography, and each node will add a new block of transactions to the blockchain. That's why it's called the blockchain. And so now what that means is that each copy, each node on the network is updating in real time in the same way. And these blocks are cryptographically connected. And so what that means is that these blocks are extraordinarily sensitive to any changes. So if you want to go ahead and change a period or change a capital letter to a lowercase letter, much less change who owns the property, it, that, the fact that that change was made and when it was made is going to be registered on the network. And so if you do want to go ahead and make a change that no one can see, you want to go ahead and say, hey, um, that property actually belongs to your friend and not the person who bought it, well, you've got to make that change on over 50% of the copies at the same time. And you have to make that change not just on one block in the history of the blockchain, but you have to make it on every single block in the history of the blockchain at the same time, and you have to do that on every single one of those 50% copies. That's very hard to do. And so to change the record of the blockchain in a way that no one can see takes a tremendous amount of computing power more than anyone has right now. Although we have, to, we have to see what will happen when quantum computing comes fully into play. And so this is why with blockchain technology, we have this new level of security, this new kind of security. Um, I'm gonna share with you two more pieces of blockchain, a few more pieces of blockchain technology so you can start to understand the examples. So there are two kinds of blockchains. One kind of blockchain is what's called permissionless. And with a permissionless blockchain, Everyone on the blockchain can see all of the information on the blockchain all the time. So Bitcoin, for example, is a permissionless blockchain. And so what that means is that with Bitcoin, you can see every single token on the Bitcoin network. You can see which address it's in. You can see exactly how many tokens each address has, and you can trace that back over the whole history of the blockchain. So what's interesting is that because the information from Bitcoin is so easy to see, it's actually easier to catch criminals using Bitcoin than to catch criminals who use ordinary bank accounts. And there are also permission blockchains. So with a permission blockchain, you get to choose who can see which data. You can choose only certain nodes with certain permissions can see particular bits of data. And so if you're gonna use a private blockchain with sensitive information about your business, or if your blockchain technology might be used for something like medical records, you're gonna use a permission blockchain. So why would you use blockchain technology and not an ordinary database? And that's the question you should always ask because this technology is very hyped, it's incredible, it has tremendous opportunity, but you wanna be thoughtful of why would you use blockchain technology? And remember, with blockchain technology, you have decentralized sharing and storing of information. So instead of that information being kept in a castle with a big moat around it, you have multiple copies. Sometimes as many as millions of copies if you look at blockchains like Bitcoin. And there are two main characteristics you want to think about. And if those are important to you, then you might want to say, hey, let's, let's talk about using a blockchain here. So I think it's funny that you actually can write nothing in stone. Um, but the, the important thing to remember here is that with Bitcoin, you can't erase history. So for those of you who've heard this, this um, notion that the victors are the ones who get to write history, a powerful way that victors do that is by just deleting and erasing the information of the people that came before them. And with blockchain technology, that underlying layer of information, it will be there. So you're still going to need to make changes. There's human error. Um, there will be new transactions happening. Um, but when you make changes, the fact that the change was made and when it was made will be registered. That's going to change your dispute resolution process. And next, blockchain technology supports the cooperation among people who otherwise wouldn't trust each other. And so if you're thinking about a system that involves multiple countries or multiple companies, that's when you want to start thinking about blockchain. And to kind of help you remember this, this is a picture of a pretty incredible decentralized truce that broke out on Christmas Eve in World War I between the French and British on the one side and the Germans on the other side. 
And this wasn't a truce that came from the generals or the leaders at the top. This came from the ordinary men on the front who were fighting each other and shooting at each other the day before and the day after. But on Christmas, they had enough shared cultural understanding that they could use Christmas to create a truce. And so we don't always have Christmas, but when we don't have Christmas, we have blockchain technology. Um, now, at Singularity, we are very hopeful and optimistic about the future. And I am quite an advocate for blockchain technology, but I want to remind you a very important caveat. Because this is not a silver bullet, it's powerful. It can create tremendous value. Um, but you have to worry about garbage in and garbage out. And what that means is that you have to think about who has the power to write to your blockchain and how do you secure that? Uh, because if the wrong people can write information to the blockchain, it doesn't matter how secure the record is if it's recording false information. And so being very thoughtful about who is setting up the blockchain, who has the right to control the nodes, how do the nodes work, you do want to get into the details of that um, over time as you're going to evaluate your solution. And how many people in the room are lawyers? I'm, I'm, a, I'm a lawyer too, so. Okay, well, I have good news for all the lawyers, maybe bad news for everyone else. Smart contracts are not going to replace lawyers. Um, and how many of you have used a smart contract? More good news, um, this time for everyone. Every single one of you has actually used a smart contract. So what a smart contract is, is it's just a piece of executable code that takes place without additional human intervention. And so what that means is that if you've ever signed up for auto renewal of Netflix or Amazon Prime, or you've done automatic bill payment, or any kind of online operation that you've set up ahead of time, you've used a smart contract. Now what's powerful is when you take smart contracts and you, you combine them with this database that you can trust, that you can deeply trust, magic can happen. So here's an example of a pretty incredible project that's using smart contracts and blockchain technology and artificial intelligence and satellite technology to save the rainforest. So what Game Forest is doing is they have come up with a way to pay indigenous communities that live in the rainforest to save their trees. And so what happens is if you want to go ahead and make a donation to save some trees in the rainforest, you can go ahead and go to the Game Forest platform and make your donation. And you've made your donation, and what will happen is if the trees that you're donating to save are still there 30 days from now, some of that donation will be unlocked, 60 days from now, 90 days from now, and so on. And this is powerful because how, did, how does the system know that the trees are still there? They can look at satellite imagery of the Earth. So our entire Earth is being imaged every day by satellites. And you can use machine learning and data science to actually analyze those images and tell with incredible accuracy whether particular trees at a particular spot in the rainforest are still there. And using blockchain technology and smart contracts, you can set up a system where if the trees are still there, the donations will unlock in a secure, reliable, safe way to the underlying communities. And so with blockchain technology, we have this new opportunity to make money programmable. Another way that this is being used is by IBM and AOS. So AOS is a very large trucking company. And for those of you who have businesses where you've actually shipped things, physical items using trucks, you know that contracts for trucking will include bonuses or aspects of the payout based on whether the goods have actually arrived on time. And so this is a new project and platform where you can set up IoT devices that will transmit the location of the truck to a blockchain. And then if the truck actually arrives on time, certain parts of the funds can be automatically released. And this saves a lot of time and money and energy and fights over lawyers. Now, remember, the system can still be cheated. If you can figure out how to hack the IoT device, or you know, there are various things you can do to try to cheat the system, but we're already living in a system where cheating is happening. So this makes it better, and it gives us a record that we can start debating from. And it gives us a point of information that we can say, hey, we're going to start evaluating this. We have our audit trail. We have our record history. So another way that blockchain technology is actually being used today is pretty incredible. Uh, last July, IBM and Maersk ran their first successful pilot around using blockchain technology to track the administration and documentation paperwork for a particular international shipping shipment of avocados in Kenya to Rotterdam in the Netherlands. 
And the pilot was so successful that Maersk actually put, by the end of last year, 10 million of its 70 million shipping containers onto its blockchain system. And it was successful enough that Maersk and IBM in January actually announced a new joint venture called TradeLens. And TradeLens now has over 94 partners around the world, various shipping authorities, shipping companies, um, that are all using the platform to use this blockchain-based system to record what is happening to international shipments as they happen in a new secure way. And Maersk has spent a lot of money, hundreds of millions of dollars on the system even before the joint venture. So why, why are they doing this now? Why, why is it only now with blockchain technology that Maersk can start to digitize its systems? And part of what, why this was so important to Maersk is that even though Maersk is one of the largest companies in the world, and Maersk was the one with the assets, Maersk was actually in the red. And there were small regional shipping companies making 15 to 20% margins with the job of helping to make sure that the right paperwork got stamped fast enough. So if you go back to Mombasa in Kenya, where the avocados are originally coming from, you actually have couriers on motorcycles who have to pass paperwork from official to official. That official has to stamp the paperwork with a stamp, paper stamp. And the papers go on from there. Uh, and, and it's like that at every single port. Um, but part of why this information had to stay on paper and couldn't come online is that if at the end of the day, what we thought were avocados arrives in Amsterdam and is a big case of white powder, that's a huge problem. And if somebody intervening deletes the edit history, then we have no audit trail. We have no way of knowing where along the way, among all the ports, the switch happened or, or who made the mistake. And with blockchain technology, you actually have these unique signatures that ports can give in a digital way where the audit history can't be easily deleted. And so that's what's important and that's why this is happening here today. And what's interesting too is that with TradeLens, that's one example. The Port of Singapore has actually launched a competitive project around the same kind of opportunity to offer blockchain as a service for international shipping. And it still remains to be seen what will be the winning platform. But what's important to remember is that this is happening very quickly. We now have the ability to digitize industries that until now have been, we've been forced to have on paper because the different ports, they don't necessarily trust each other. And even if you can digitize within your company, when you're working with different ports, different countries, different companies, you've needed paper. Now, for, for those of you, I'm, I, for those of you who've ever been sick or had a loved one who's been sick, you know, we are, we're fortunate we're here today. And we were lucky enough if we got medicine to get medicine that worked. But up to one in 10 medicines in the developing world today are fake. And according to the World Health Organization, fake medicines kill up to a million people a year. And one of the things that's incredible, there are so many incredible things about our internet, but one of the challenges of our internet is that it's made it easier than ever to introduce fake products into the market. And with fake medicine, if you go to the pharmacy and the pharmacist thinks they're selling you a real medicine, you think you're buying it and it doesn't have the active ingredient, it's fake. That can be fatal for you or for a loved one. And so this is an enormous, enormous problem. And it's such a big problem and, and folks around the world don't exactly know what to do about it. In the US, we've launched new legislation called the Drug Safety Compliance Act. But pharmaceutical companies don't even necessarily know what system they can use to comply. And so MetaLedger is a project, it's a blockchain project that's been started by a consortium of some of the largest pharmaceutical companies in the world, including Genentech, Pfizer, AbbVie. Um, and what MetaLedger is doing is they're building out a blockchain-based system to start to track pharmaceuticals. And they're hopeful that this system will actually enable them to comply with these new laws in the US. And what's interesting about that is, you know, I'm somebody where I also do a great deal of regulatory work in blockchain technology, and with many of the financial applications for blockchain technology, for cryptocurrencies, for digital assets, compliance is a real challenge. And what's exciting is to see blockchain technology applied to other industries where it can actually support compliance in an unprecedented way. Um, but again, with MetaLedger, 
a real key is to figure out, well, who's gonna, how are these medicines gonna be tracked from manufacturing to when you actually get them in a way where we can enter the information reliably onto our blockchain network and so that you can test reliably that this particular bottle of a medicine hasn't been tampered with and is connected to this blockchain. So there's still some, a lot, many open questions here, but it's a very exciting active area project. So before we dive a bit more into where this technology is going, I wanna step back and, and share with you something that I, I find very exciting. So Mark Andreessen is a very famous venture capitalist in Silicon Valley, and he has said, if you're not a software company, you better go be a software company because software is eating the world. If you're doing business your old traditional way and you've got margins, someone somewhere is gonna use software to do it better, to do it faster, they're gonna eat those margins. So be a software company. And blockchain entrepreneurs say, well, guess what? Software is eating software because Uber, Amazon, Facebook, Google, they have big margins. And blockchain technology holds the hope of doing what these companies can do in a disintermediated way, in a way that still can securely connect producer and consumer and can lower the, raise the amount that the producer gets, lower the costs of the consumer, and meanwhile attack the middlemen. And so Sergey Brin actually said a few months ago that he's concerned that Google's fallen behind in blockchain technology. All of these companies on the, on the slide, they're all investing actively in blockchain technology, thinking about how they're gonna use it, how they're gonna apply it. Um, but the thing to remember too is that in 1994 when Amazon started, nobody had any idea what Amazon would be today. And certainly in 1994, no one who used the internet thought Airbnb could possibly be one of the biggest, company, biggest privately held companies in the world. And so the internet has surprised us since its development. And I wanna remind you, this new technology, blockchain technology, what some people call the internet of value, will surprise us. And so the applications that really rely on this decentralized technology, many of them don't exist yet. And we wanna be thoughtful about what are things that we can now do with this technology that we just could never do before. So now we're gonna talk a bit about the future of this technology, where it's going. I shared with you this black box, the black box of cryptography that again, lets us update the network in the same way at the same time across nodes. And with Bitcoin, I know some people here are, you love Bitcoin even more than me, um, but Bitcoin uses old technology. It's powerful technology. It's the first possible technology, but it's slow and it's energy intensive. So has anyone here heard of Bitcoin mining? What the Bitcoin miners are doing is they're solving a problem, a, a math problem, that takes a lot of computational power to solve but it's easy to check that they solved it. And what is that problem? So every single block on the whole history of the blockchain has a number. One, two, three, four, 787,989, and so on. And in front of that number is a random number of zeros. And the number of zeros is always random, and the only way to check is there, there, there's very little you can do to, to be clever and fast about predicting the number of zeros. So you need to use computational power to brute force check how many zeros are there. And if you're the first one to successfully, to successfully solve the problem of how many zeros there are in front of the block, well, guess what? You get to go push out the new block to the blockchain. And those are the transactions that become part of the network. So what stops you from cheating? What stops you from putting out a false block? You can only put out the block if you actually get the number of zeros right. And you're not the only one trying to figure out how many zeros are in front of the, that, that number. All the miners are competing with each other to be the first and the fastest to solve the problem. So if you, if you solve the problem and then you go ahead and try to cheat, well, guess what? Someone else has already solved the problem and pushed out the new block. That's, that's how the Bitcoin mining network, that's how the Bitcoin network updates the network in the same way at the same time. It's called proof of work. And the thing is that when Bitcoin was first developed, you could actually mine it quickly with small computer, with an ordinary desktop computer. But then people got smart and they thought, wow, well, what if I use more computing power? 
I can solve the problem faster. And so every side, all the miners are in this arms race of using more and more computing power to solve the problem. So now to successfully mine Bitcoin, you need a huge mining farm of servers. And the thing is that these, all this computing power, it's going just to calculating the number of zeros in front of the blocks on the Bitcoin network. It's a waste of energy. Um, it does keep the Bitcoin network secure. And so people have been trying to figure out, well, what are new, better ways uh, that we can update the network that might be faster? So Tezos is an example of a network that actually uses something called proof of stake. And so what that means is if you hold Tezos tokens, you can go ahead and, and set up your system to, to work on verifying the Tezos network. And you put up your tokens as collateral. So if you go ahead and try to cheat the system and you fail to cheat successfully, you're actually going to lose your tokens. And so Tezos is the first proof of, state network, proof of stake network that's a public network to be launched, to be running live. So the mainnet is live. It's being used today. It's very exciting. The other cool thing about Tezos is that Tezos has built in a mechanism for updating the network. So new cryptography is coming out all the time. And if that new cryptography is good enough, then the, the people, the, the holders of Tezos, the people staking Tezos, can choose to actually pay developers to update the network using that new technology. And that's important because as new as blockchain is, remember, blockchain technology has been possible only for 10 years. And putting smart contracts on the blockchain has only been reliably possible since the development of Ethereum in 2015. So this is brand new technology. But already, this technology is evolving so rapidly that blockchain technology is now in some ways old. So remember, with blockchain, I've been describing it as um, a, a way of updating a network, a decentralized network across the nodes. So think of each node as a participant. Each copy, each node of the network contains a copy of the whole history of transactions. And if you think about it, as the network grows, as it's used more and more, each node is going to have to carry an exponentially increasing number of transactions. That's going to become difficult. So what cryptographers have been working on is a technology called sharding. And with sharding, you actually don't update the network in the same way in the same time across all the nodes. Um, you update it in organically um, shifting ways where you can still prove that the network as a whole is updating reliably. And so sharding is this new technology that something like Tezos could conceivably incorporate if it becomes proved out. So it's still very new. One, one thing to, to hopefully inspire everyone sitting here is that blockchain technology, it's brand new. And in countries where and Mexico actually is relatively advanced compared to many countries in the world, but there's still this opportunity where the systems are not working well enough to use new technology leapfrog. And in the US, we're a little slow to adopt this technology because our systems work pretty well, although there are 100 million people in the US without access to the banking system. So we have enormous problems. Um, but one of the incredible things about exponential technology is there really is this opportunity to solve your problems in a way that helps you leapfrog. I want to share with you a place to go if you want more. So this is a book by uh, Paul Vinge and Michael Casey. Paul Vinge is with the Wall Street Journal. Michael Casey was with the Wall Street Journal, but after writing a book on cryptocurrency in 2016 called The Age of Cryptocurrency, he was so impressed by this new technology that he actually went and joined MIT's Digital Currency Initiative. Now, the truth machine, I can recommend it to you now. It was written in March. I don't know how long I'll be able to recommend it. And the authors already say, don't read our 2016 book. It's too old. Everything in there is wrong. Maybe not everything, but they say read this one and not that one. Um, and so with that, I want to leave you all with this question of how will you use blockchain technology? One of the things that's incredible about our world today is regardless of whether it's the internet, blockchain technology, 3D printing, the great companies of the future are likely not to be in Silicon Valley. And I, I say that with a little sadness as I do live in San Francisco. Um, but the, com the great companies of the future and the great innovations of the future have the potential and the probability to come from all over the world, particularly this technology, which is decentralized, and which each of you can be empowered to think about using and applying in your life and in your business, um, and to make your government and your world better. And so with that, I want to thank you all for taking the time to hear me today. It's such a pleasure to be here with you.
And my email's there, and I do encourage you and would love for you to reach out to me and email me if you have any questions about blockchain technology, business ideas that you have on this technology. It's, it's just an absolute pleasure to hear from you. And thank you very much.